life of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jack. Gender adjustments, there'll be no, none tonight, and this meeting is being audio taped. Uh, number three, approve the minutes. I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the set of minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Second by Rockland. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aubrey, would you like to introduce this student? Uh, I'd be honored time? to. Uh, we're joined tonight by Faith Ryan. She is a senior in our horticulture program constituent. Uh, she is a very uh, formidable young person. I think you're going to hear a different kind of report tonight from her. Um, I think she's going to speak honestly to you folks about what she's exploring and what the kids are feeling with the hybrid model. Uh, Faith is the Back when she was a sophomore, she was the first student in this building to win an FFA award, the Future Founders of America, when she was a little sophomore. So now she's a big senior, and she's ready to represent the school and let you guys know what the kids are feeling and what's going on. Ms. Ryan. So first things first, our student council is doing the pumpkin carving contest, which is completely virtual. So obviously you have to buy your own pumpkin, and it's not at the school. You have to do it at your house. And then what we're doing is we're taking pictures of the pumpkins and having them all sent to Mr. Filano. And we built a whole website to it. And he uploads them all. And then by the due date, which is the 23rd, which is this Friday, um, voting's gonna be open. And the winner gets apparel and merch for the school. Um, and as for the learning aspect of this, um, I feel like a lot of kids are struggling because it's hard to learn online for a lot of kids here because as you know, this is a vocational school. Most of us are hands-on learners. Um, that's why we came to the school in the first place. And it's hard to learn online when we can't be in school with the kids and learning with the teachers with our hands, which is how most of us learn the best. Um, so a lot of kids are struggling with that. And I've talked to a lot of kids in my own grade and I've seen a lot of kids struggling with their grades because of this, because they don't get the help that they usually get in the building every day during the school hours. Um, so there are a lot of kids struggling with their grades, and that's preventing a lot of kids in my own shop from going out on co-op um, because they don't have the proper grades they need because they're not getting the help they need, which I think is a big problem, and there needs to be something to fix that. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say on that. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Faith. Are you on co op now? No. No. Okay. Question, Faith. No. Yes. Shops, you do come to school. Yes. It depends on what shop you're in. Most of the hands on shops, like HVAC, carpentry, horticulture, we're all in all five days. But shops like Graphic, Allied Health, they're only in two days because they can do most of it online it's mostly book work for that. Thank you. Yes. How do you like the horticulture program? Um, I honestly love it. It was my first choice as a freshman because um, I've always been interested in the outdoors and maintaining it and it's just a really fun experience to have and it's good life lessons you learn. Um, I like it a lot. Good. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Nice today. <coughs> Reports. Uh, Jim, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the treasurer's report this evening um, on the cover of you that, that was sent out to everybody. We have uh, just a, a listing of COVID-related expenses through through the first of October. We spent about two hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars on COVID-related expenses, and what happens with those is through the Plymouth County CARES Act funding, we we go and we. Um, allocate based upon the number of students and then we will build all the towns our in-district towns in our, our out of district towns now the Plymouth County towns are all covered by the Plymouth County CARES Act 
whereas the towns that we serve that are outside of Plymouth County, they're dealt with a little bit differently because they're, they're more direct for, for those towns. Um, we've also, with, as far as the COVID-related expenses, we've also signed up with FEMA. Again, a lot of um, uh, emails saying that you, we should go to FEMA as well or first. And we, FEMA is a little bit more strict in what is allowable as a COVID-related expense. Um, and the first deadline passed last Thursday. We submitted about $74,000 with the reimbursement request to FEMA. Um, so we'll see whether, you know, again, it, it's almost like a line item veto type of thing. Where they'll go through the lines, we told them what we needed the stuff for, and then they will come back and, and give us a reimbursement. They reimburse at 75%. So whatever we get from FEMA, we'll knock off the, this list, and we, we're not going to go ask both places, Plymouth County and FEMA. But again, we're giving FEMA a try to see um, how, how they do with the reimbursements as, as part of that. Of the, of the picture. Um, our cash position as of September 30th, cash balances overall about $6.4 million between all of our operating and stabilization accounts. Um, again, down from the end of the year, but again, we, we spent a lot of money the, the first three months and um, okay, we've, we've done one round of um, billing for our member towns. Uh, we don't bill the out of district tuition until November 1st, so that'll be going out to that shortly. Um, our OPEP account again is, is $766,000 going up about a thousand a month every every month so things are looking well there. Our revenue for the for the um, month of September we've got um, all of our um, we, we build first of August we get most of our revenue in August and then in September we have a couple of towns that, that send their checks. We don't expect our money from our towns you know within a week or two so things things come in. So we received a little over a million dollars for our, our first assessment billing um, in in um, September. We've been paid by seven out, out of our eight towns. Uh, Norwell is the one town that hasn't paid us yet, but uh, Trish has reached out to them last week about just sending them another copy of the invoice. I know with, with the way the town halls work with COVID, everything's expected to be delayed a little bit, so there's no issues there. Um, we are still getting our, our regular Chapter 70 money, the $370,000 per month, which is pretty much, um, there has been no pickup in any of the, the budget processes with the state. Um, so we, we're still getting our, our, our scheduled payment from uh, the state on our uh, Chapter 70 overall. About a million four receipts so far uh, during the month of September. Um, page three has all of our expenditures during the course of the um, course of the month. Again, about eight hundred ninety-one thousand dollars of expenditures um, expenses for the month. Nothing glaring, nothing out of, out of line. Um, you know, there's, there's always a there's rush to get the teachers a lot of the supplies that they need a lot of a lot of one-time payments there um, we do have some unemployment we have 15,000 of unemployment responsibilities again there are some people out there um, on unemployment we've challenged one or two of them to people that um, they left the school then they collected on them they filed for unemployment because their second job laid them off but you know we should be responsible for some of us so we're protesting about one or two of those things so Overall, things are um, pretty strong and pretty normal uh, for the month of September. Um, and that's it for the uh, Treasury. I'll ask for a motion to approve the Treasurer's report. Uh, I'll second. Hanson. Hanson. Hanson and Whitman. Second by Whitman. Any discussion? Yeah, I have a question, Jim, yes. if I may. Um, looking at the COVID-19 uh, COVID expenses, uh, is that is that what you expect for the full year, or that's up till now? That's uh, that's what we spent up. That's what we've been covered in and, and spent up through up through the first of October. So right. Do you expect that to increase even more? Yes. All right. The reason I'm saying that is because like women's portion of this first thing is uh, almost fifty-five thousand dollars. Right. Right. Uh, Friday we'll be receiving a check from Plymouth County for a little over thirty-two thousand. Right. To pay for some of this. So. We, we haven't billed women yet, so we're, we're waiting for the, we're going through the process. I think the, the billing required, we had to do projections for, for um, various towns. We, sent, we did projections based upon, uh, through this, we will reach out to Tom and ask for projections regarding, um, you know, through the end of December. Again, the, 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 the CARES Act funding only goes through December, so, and again, the rules, especially with FEMA, 
you can't have a supply more than you can't afford to stop eating. You can only they'll only pay for like a 60 day supply. So you, we can't go out and buy 17,000 masks and right. expect them to pay for everything. So there's rules with everything. Um, I think the next round of billing that we're going to do to the towns is, is due by the end of October, and that'll be through the end of September because I know that from the counties getting their money from the government in various stages as well. So right. what, what I want to do is what I want to do is tomorrow I will be talking to our interim town administrator and letting her know that what we we can be expecting uh, we're going to be getting like a bill from you. Yes. And that that monies that we get from Plymouth County should go into some type of an account. So that as different as we expenses come in both the towns and from the schools, regional schools, that's where we'll draw from. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and pretty much if we, the, the local towns are just a conduit where we'll submit a bid to a town and the town will pour that over to the county and then the money will go to the town and then they'll, they'll come to us. We received a few checks already. We did a first round of billing of like $8,000 back in the right. And this is a significant amount of money, the 268. Where are we drawing that from? Um, well, right now it's it's in it's in um, well, the budget transfer will will we'll handle about thirty thousand of that. But there's medical supplies, there's um, um, repairs and maintenance. We, like it's fresh in my mind because we submitted it on, on last Thursday. We're doing a lot of air quality uh, repairs and upgrades to our system. Right. Um, we're buying we're upgrading our remote services. Um, we're buying I think 80, 80 Chromebooks just arrived in the building last week. So again, there's a lot of those types of things that are coming through. So a lot of them are in, in supplies. Um, we've, we've earmarked the sub, so we've tagged every all those receipts. So Janine can run a report of all our COVID-19 expenditures and, and so forth. And we've ordered a bunch of stuff. We ordered, we've ordered a ton of Chromebooks. We haven't received them all yet. So, um, but as we receive things and we pay the bills, everything's all um, accounted for and so forth. So, but it's, all the COVID expenses are spread out throughout the budget. But we know exactly where they are based okay. upon Janine's. Um, and one of the, um, and again, I want to praise Janine. She's been with us for a few months. She's been with Sylvia. She's doing a great job um, because once we do all the billing for the towns, and again, as a reminder to our school community members, we have to send them copies of the signed warrants that we, um, for the, that the fact that the, the expenditure was voted on by the school committee. Um, we have to send them copies of all the invoices and a lot of manual kind of putting together a package of stuff that we're going to have to now send out to a bunch of different towns. So there's a lot of work involved. And we're prepping and, and accumulating all that data right now. To yeah, the, the, next the town needs to show exactly where that those local fundings are going to. Yes, yes. So, so it's, it's been, um, and, and again, for Rockland, uh, Elizabeth Zelensky has been one of the um, our contacts who are helping with the towns, and she's been very involved. In, yeah. in very helpful with Janine, you know, double checking as far as what the expenditures, what the towns need to send it from the county. We want to make sure we don't have to do it twice. So we send. So Elizabeth's been very helpful with um, with that process as well. So funny, I really enter it today, Tom. Yeah. So, you know, she's been great, yeah. So. Town administrator just said he thought it was paid, and he'll check with the accountant in the morning to find out why we haven't got it. Okay. Fine. He just ding me back. <laughs> Jim, how many more Chromebooks, sorry, do we have to have on, uh, around back order? I think Tom was in the order We had an order for 80 and an order for 30. Um, so just 30 more? I think it's, I think it's, we're, we're, we are not short for the students. Every, all right. the students have what they have what they need. We're swapping out some laptops. I don't know the exact number, but we did get a good chunk of them in just recently. Okay, so just like maybe 30, 35. <laughs> We received 60, Mr. Mahoney, we're still waiting on 50. Okay. Now, as far as one of the, um, the expenses related to the example the Chromebooks come in, once the Chrome, Chromebooks come in, they have to be set up and... Yep. So we've hired a part-time person in the IT department to help facilitate and get... He, he's working on getting these Chromebooks up and ready and, and to be used by the students and the faculty and so forth. So we've had some expenses. We've got COVID-related expenses for payroll regarding the, the, um, the COVID room LPN, and we have additional expenses. We have additional, again, because we're doing two bus runs now in the morning, as opposed to long, we've got added costs um, for, for bus drivers and custodial help and, and other stuff. So again, you, it, that stuff all accumulates as far as, um, it's not just Chromebooks and, and air handling systems and remote services and, and 
so, but there are other payroll related um, expenses as well across the board. So, um, so that's pretty much the that status. And the next piece is just the budget transfer for um, medical supplies um, for thirty thousand dollars. Because again, a lot of the PPP expenses related to um, the purchases are going into the, the medical supplies account that's managed by the nursing program. So, by uh, my nurse, Paulette. So. All right, now uh, we have a motion for the treasurer's report. Any discussion on the treasurer's report? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. The motion carries. Yeah, the uh, budget transfer is. Second. Second by, was that Rockland? Okay. Any discussion on the budget transfers? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Motion carries. Chairman, um, I have nothing tonight. Um, we're all set there. Subcommittees. No subcommittee reports tonight. Mr. Chairman, I could comment on capital projects. Yeah, yeah, if you could, just briefly. Capital. That would be I good. want to say thank you uh, to the uh, members of our capital project subcommittee, uh, Bob Mahoney, Bob Mola. Uh, Bob Hayward and Jack Manning, they're, they're serving in an important capacity. Uh, I'd just like to bring the full committee up to speed and, and also give you a heads up that we'll probably be talking about this at a future meeting in, in November and leading into to the budget cycle. You may remember that as part of our fiscal 21 budget, we set aside some design fees to begin the process of putting together plans for some uh, projects that we know have been a priority of ours and are part of our master facilities plan. So over the next month, the, sub, the capital project subcommittee will be tasked with interviewing owners, project manager candidates. Uh, by law, if we have any work that exceeds $1.5 million, you need to have an owner's project manager. And the task for the OPM will be to assist us as we begin the process of working on design work for the roof on our 1992 edition window and uh, panel replacement. That work is, uh, like I said, within the next few weeks uh, into November so that we can begin that process. <coughs> the, larger, the larger task for the subcommittee to bring recommendations back over the next month or two is going to involve us taking that next step into our master facilities plan where it would lead to us seeking uh, the committee's support to authorize the borrowing of money. We've done great work and you've been very supportive of a lot of enhancements to the building. As I told the capital project subcommittee, we've now reached the point where absent MSBA, as each year goes by, there are projects that are a little bit too big for us to justify fitting into a single fiscal year, and therefore we would have to entertain the idea of borrowing money. Now there is no immediate plan to begin massive construction in fiscal 22 that would be getting ahead of ourselves. But what I would be asking the subcommittee to help me with and then bring to this full committee as a form of a recommendation would be to look at the capital projects matrix with me and to prioritize where the expenses are most, uh, where should we be putting our resources. And for those of you who were on the committee in 2010, you might recall that the last time we borrowed money was when we put a new roof on the 1962 uh, uh, original building. We did that in the summer of 2011. But in order to have a project start in the summer of 2011, we actually went to our towns in the spring of 2010. And preceding that, this committee voted in March of 2010 to authorize debt. Under the law, regional school committees have the ability to vote to authorize. Doesn't mean that that is a power of the purse. The power belongs to the towns. But the way the law works is that when a committee authorizes debt, there's a 60-day window for communities in the form of a town meeting to either take action and if they take action, then they would have to vote to support it with a majority vote at a town meeting, or a town may choose to take no action, and that would be considered in the affirmative. 
So what I'm going to be asking the subcommittee to consider and then bring back to everybody for further discussion is the idea that if we wanted to put ourselves in a position to begin to take on work like a roof project, window project, overhaul ventilation, in addition to the building, modest addition to the building, uh, we actually have to have those conversations now. And I explained to the subcommittee that it is my intention to start very informally, but early, by reaching out to your respective town administrators to just give them a heads up. Because as you know, for this regional school district to get a debt authorization, it requires all of our towns to agree, either in the form of an affirmative town meeting vote or, or taking no action. And so I, my hope is to explain that and give town administrators a heads up and then let the process run its course where we can talk as a full committee about these priorities and chart a course for the next few years. A debt authorization does not mean that the district immediately borrows the sum of money in its entirety and does everything immediately. What it can mean is, depending on how the warrant article is written, you can seek a debt authorization to include funding for a series of projects, and then as we move forward with our master facilities plan to try to complete the recommendations, we can map that out as, as years go forward. The timing is good for many reasons, not the least of which is that we all know we need to do these projects, but also that we have no debt other than, I think, a $4,500 in, uh, interest payment to kind of mop up this year. So it's very, it, so we would be going into fiscal 22 with no other debt on the books. So more to be, more to be said on that, Mr. Chairman, but I do appreciate there's a, there are several homework assignments <laughs> that the subcommittee is willing to roll up their sleeves and get into. But I would expect that we could bring something to the full committee for discussion at our November meeting so that you, and I will send you some de more detailed information once the subcommittee uh, does a little more work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, new new uh, superintendent director, Rick, uh, Bob, if you can continue with your report. Thank you. Although, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Me again? Uh, I want to say thank you as, uh, as when we last met, we were only a couple of days into the school year and now we're a month in the rearview mirror. Thanking our business office, as Jim has noted, uh, they are the tip of the spear when it comes to making sure that we're going to get all reimbursable dollars that we're eligible to get. And that takes the cooperation of our department heads and administrators to make sure that everything is properly documented. And I'm very pleased with how that's moving along. I cannot say enough about our staff and how they have rolled out and have become so flexible with the model that we have in place. Teachers moving, the kids staying where they are, the safety measures. Students are grateful to be in school. Masks, social distancing, follow the arrows in the hallway, and all of the other nuisances that we've come to understand. Them Having them in a community really, really matters. Beyond, beyond the positive start to this school year, I want to make one other brief COVID mention, and that has to do with the, um, what I'm expecting is some upcoming guidance to come from the Department of Education. We all know about the COVID map that gets published. Uh, usually it's actually published Wednesday nights or, or, or maybe overnight into Thursday. And we know about the red, yellow, and green coding of towns. And last Wednesday, a lot of towns in the Route 3 corridor uh, moved into to red. And we, we, we all consume media and we know that red, red, red equals bad and what, what does that mean. So I wanted to give you just a, a brief overview as how I, I'm seeing it and what I'm hearing. The first factor is when you have a, when you have a community, we have eight of course, and, and if you want to by extension even towns beyond our district. One of the factors the state wants us to consider is that we look at these maps for at least three weeks and that we don't draw any, there is no immediate trigger that if, if, if red then something like close or go all remote. So we need to look at the data for at least two more Wednesdays and see what those numbers look like. And then where the state is going to go is they're going to provide some additional guidance <coughs> about looking at what might have triggered a red designation within a particular community. Depending on the size of our community, there could be a very small cluster or a single incident that could have moved the community into the red. You could have two communities in the red, one where there was, a, there was an event, it led to, a, it led to a, a controlled number of folks getting uh, tested positive, and that could have raised it into the red category. Whereas others, there might have been no discernible event. 
So the state is going to be asking us to look at that as a factor, and then also look at the look at look at us on the local level as well. So in any event, uh, I'll be looking to see what the data looks like uh, this upcoming, uh, you know, this evening or into tomorrow, and then next week as well, and consider all of those other factors. But that's something that's getting getting a little bit of traction right now in the press, and I would expect that there'll be some more guidance on that coming out uh, coming out very soon. Mr. Chairman, I'll just continue with recruitment and program advisory. Uh, as we move into the school year, despite all that we're dealing with, there are certain things that we do at certain times of the year. And this is recruitment season, although it's going to look a lot different. We are, we are planning to have two virtual uh, open houses, if you will. Uh, and they will run on uh, a little bit later than usual, but they will run on Saturday, November 14th, and on Tuesday, December 1st. The Saturday open house will be in the morning. If I want to participate in this open house, I can register, and then I can get sent a link, and I will be able to be introduced to all of the teachers and all of the programs in a structured schedule, plus a seminar on academics and student life. We'll run that on a Saturday, and we'll also run that during the week on, on December 1st. We are still going to try to run tours in the building, but I call, I'm calling them museum tours because don't touch, no one's here, be quiet. <laughs> but it will probably be a very scaled back model, but we can do that. I would envision one family, I would envision them telling us in advance which handful of shops do they want to see. I would envision us doing this after hours. But we're not going to talk about the, the, the individual family touring and the small group touring. I've got to tell you, you, we don't talk about this enough, but despite having wildly successful in-person open houses in October, our ninth grade admissions counselor, Amy Dow, actually tours about 200 additional families after open house through the end of the calendar year and into the winter. And she does a great job with it. And the folks that are setting aside the time to come as a family and, to, and tour the school on a set schedule uh, have a pretty high rate of application. So we know we're not going to be able to service that volume, either because the interest out in the community might be a little bit lower. So that was one of the rationales to having a couple of these open house sessions. So uh, we'll, see what, we'll see how November 14th goes, but we intend to operate something similar on December 1st. And uh, we'll continue to provide uh, outreach and support. We're building a lot more digital content on our website. We want there to be on-demand recruitment materials. We all look up information on our own schedule, three in the morning, whatever, Sunday. Whatever. And we want to make sure that when folks are interested in learning more about us, that they have the ability to do so on our website. So we're having, we're having administrators and counselors work on digital content to add to what's already there in the hopes it can help paint a complete picture of what we do. <coughs> and uh, I'll just quickly <coughs> mention program advisory. We, uh, we are also doing a similar model. We're running our fall program advisory. Uh, we won't be serving virtual chicken dinner. Uh, we have, we'll have to put that in front of the camera at home. But we'll be running that off. We'll be splitting it on two separate evenings based on the shop program. Uh, and that, will, uh, and that will allow our administrators to also be able to be in attendance at those meetings. So we're still moving ahead with program advisory and recruitment in, uh, in, in the fall as normal. Can I answer any questions on, on recruitment or program advisory? Thank you. Uh, Tom, just want to, uh, yeah. I just want to make a comment. Uh, Amy does a fantastic job with what she does. And uh, it doesn't go unnoticed by some of the members here, I would assume all the members, but um, she's already started interviewing. Right? Yes, even prior to any recruitment out of the gate, yeah. we have at least 60 applications already. Yeah. And, and the mm -hmm. interview process, will, which is it, it's a common refrain, our interviews will be done online as well. So yes, we are, we're actually we're starting that earlier than usual. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I'll just uh, go out of order and make a note that we do have a, a, a plumbing textbook that I'll be uh, putting in for purchase to be uh, used by our HVAC program. Mm -hmm. And then I will, I think we, I covered everything, and I will uh, turn it over to Mr. Aubrey for an administrator update. Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Uh, Mr. Hickey is correct, we've been in school 
five weeks as of today. And um, I will say Faith Ride is correct as well. We're all kind of adjusting to, I hate the term, the new normal. Uh, I don't like that term, but it is what it is. Uh, so we are educating the students on how they get their extra help. The teachers are here before and after school. If the students want to come in before school, they can, we can get them bus transportation. If they want to stay after school, their parents can bring them back and forth. Uh, it's, it's an educational process. It's just not the norm of what they do. Oh, I need help, I'll stay after school. That can't really happen. There has to be a little bit of planning involved. And so we're working with the students on doing that. Uh, we have our, besides advisory and admissions and things, we are doing parent-teacher conferences in about two weeks. Those are all virtual as well. So there'll be a five minute window where each uh, parent can sign up with the teacher and have five minutes to talk about their student and then go on to the next class. So that is happening on the 29th. We'll have afternoon sessions so the vocational people can talk to some students, talk to some parents and then at night it'll just be the administrators because the vocational staff will be in advisory meetings. Uh, we're, we're trying to move toward a normal school year. So there are things like Tom says that need to happen at certain times. So we've started those things. You all received your yearbook today. From last year, we have already started putting together next year's yearbook. Uh, student council, as, as Faith mentioned, is doing their pumpkin contest, which some teachers have entered. So I'll maybe be able to tell you how we did uh, in the contest. We're going in no names, but we'll see how we do. <laughs> we started having clubs and activities also going virtual. Our drama club started last Tuesday night with over 50 students logged into their virtual meeting. They're going to do a series of a little different things because right now they're not planning on doing their usual dinner theater. They're going to do some voiceover work and something we're really excited about. We're going to work with one of the sending elementary schools and they're going to pick a book and the kids are going to draw the pages of the book and then our students are going to be the voices and the voiceover stuff. So we're going to just kind of tweak a little bit, you know, the 2020 version, and, and we're going to make that happen. So our clubs and activities are starting to grind up, and everything is virtual, where we're trying to get those things out. Uh, FFA, which uh, Faith is a big member in, and Skills USA are also running as well. We're studying those programs are going to come. They're going to look a little different. We won't be going to regionals at Greater New Bedford this year. Regionals will be done virtually in the schools where they are. So the student will take the in-school test, they'll take the regional test, and then we'll figure out what happens with states. That might be a hybrid model. But the usual stuff that we do is happening, and it, it feels good in the building to get back to traditional learning and traditional activities that we do. I do need to, um, one final thing, I need to commend Mr. Boyle, uh, Mr. Mello, Mr. Bello, and the entire co-op team. As of tonight, we have 47 seniors on co-op already, and we should have another five by the time the seniors are back on, on November 2nd. So that is more than one-third of the class already out on co-op, so I need to commend them. And I need to commend the students who are doing what they need to do to make sure that they can get out and learn the trade skills they need. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mahoney. Mr. Aubrey, on the uh, seniors going out and eligibility for co-op with the going on what Ryan said tonight, is yeah. the, uh, it, are the standards being still the, the same standards as in the past or are we kind of stepping down a little bit to allow to allow more students out on co-op? We have, we have co-op standards and for seniors it's a 75 in academics and it's an 85 in their shop program. But I will say you, tell you that we do look at each student and we look at them separately and decide what's in the best interest of that student. Okay, because I guess, like she said, if they're struggling with grades and academics and the way the virtual touring is and how it's working out, and, uh, yes. and just, that's, that's, oh, just, no, it's that's not what? just that shop, I'm sure it's just a, a, a few of them going on there. And that's a great number compared to our past. Right, we're, we're ahead of where we've been the, the last two years. Yeah. In, in 2020, it's amazing. Um, we, I can finish up by saying Allied Health Program. Um, 
we, are work, we now have okay to send them out on co-op jobs as long as they do not need their CNA license. The state has not been able to schedule our students. They're ready for it, but the state hasn't been able to schedule the test for us. So we can put students out in co-op jobs as long as they don't need that license. That just came down last week. So we'll be able to, there's another shop that we haven't been able to do anything with. Right. Where we would open up. Cosmetology is another shop that we do not have any co Cosmo students out on co-op because they haven't been able to take the test. So when you really look at this number of say 52, 53 on the second, that includes two shops whose students cannot go out right now. So it's, it's really, it's a great work for the entire school, including the students. Okay, thank you. Well, you have something? Yeah, <clears throat> kind of going back to what Tom was for both Tom and Hart. How are we doing with COVID in terms of students, staff, whatever? If we had cases, and we had people that had to stay home? Has that happened at all there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I will say, not naming names, but Colette Worrell, our nurse, is in contact with families on a daily basis. If they, if they have a sore throat or whatever it may be, she's the one who is really helping them. And as we mentioned, at the last meeting, we do have an understanding with Hanover Fire Department and testing for our staff and students who live in Hanover, and we have made use of that on occasion as well. Have we had any positive tests? That's what I mean. Have we had we, cases? Yes, 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 we have. We so, have. so we've had, I've, I've sent out two notices since the start of the year. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm pleased about is that we're seeing great cooperation from parents so if a parent knows that their child is symptomatic mm -hmm. and it's on their watch they're still letting us know cool. so the parents have gotten the message that they're not they're not fooling around with us and uh, you know mrs. Worrell is not either so if someone if someone is presenting with symptoms we have an entire protocol that, that we're following as well and again we know we know it, it can get a little complicated when it comes to calculating quarantine days and right. things like that uh, but I'm very pleased with how that's being tracked. So uh, just another comment would be is that there's free testing over at Massasoit. Uh, I think it's Monday to Friday, and I'm not sure what it is on weekends, but it's 2 to 7 for free testing. Okay. It's drive up. Yep. And uh, yeah, so. yeah, I know the Hanover Fire <laughs> personal experience. It came to my house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, did a little nose swap my wife and I shipped it off by five o'clock in the morning. We had the email that we were negative. It's that quick, so yeah. don't hesitate to use them. Yeah. They've been a very good resource and continue to be a good partner for us. Okay, thank, thank you, Mike. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, is that it? That's all. Okay. okay. All right, Dan, you ready? <laughs> up. We have, have we taken the textbook? Have we no. no we're right appoint a delegate to the Mass uh, Association of School Committee General Assembly. I'll make the motion. We just nominate Dan. <laughs> Second. 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 That's why I asked if you were ready. <laughs> it's already written in the minutes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> we already have time. All right. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, yes. It's unanimous, really oh, good. Even Dan, you agree. <laughs> even you agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next item is the temporary policy change, admission policy. First, I'd ask for a motion to suspend the two month policy approval process. I'll make the motion. No, I won't. Second. Second by Rockland. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? Suspending? It's unanimous, thank you. Next, I ask for a motion to approve the policy changes that we received. Um, any, any discussion on that? Or it, Hansen, you've made a motion to accept them. Second by Andy Tavington. Any discussion on those? Policy changes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Donation. We received a donation for. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I lost it. 2007 Nissan. 2007 Nissan Versa. 
Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you didn't get that. Do I have a motion to? Uh, these make you doubt. Um, do <laughs> Some old to yeah. hear it. Thank you, women. Second. 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 Any discussion? No. Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, I, I have one comment. Go ahead, sir. I wonder if that good woman that walks between the truck and the car steals the French fries out of the Nissan Versa and it, it follows its track. If that's the survivor of this car. Don't <laughs> uh, know. Well, it could be. Warrants. Are we going to do the textbook? Did we already do it? We already did the it's textbook. Just an informational item. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you. That's right. Warrants, sir. Uh, warrants. We have two tonight. Uh, warrants. One, one A, two, two one o oh, one, twenty seven A, two X and three X. Total sum. For those total warrants is one million six hundred eighty-eight thousand one hundred eighty-eight dollars and thirty cents. So moved. Thank you. Now, Whitman. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The second warrant for this evening is uh, warrants four B, five, five A, six, seven, and seven M for a total of one million three hundred thirty-nine thousand. And eighty dollars and sixty-three cents. Second, second by uh, Sidgwick. Any discussion on that one? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. The motion carries on both. Any requests for action? Seeing none. Whitman, do you have a motion to adjourn with all due respect? Thank you. Second by Addington. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's a wrap.